Hello and welcome everyone to yet another thrilling episode of Radio Free Bay Ridge. I'm Eric Schell. I'm Mary Hedex. And though we are but two years out from the New York 11 race, we have a very exciting interview for you today. Yeah, we're interviewing Brittany Ramos de Barro. She is the first candidate to declare her campaign for Congress in New York 11. Brittany started her career as a military logistics officer. She was deployed to Afghanistan, but when she came back, she transitioned into community organizing and became an anti-war and anti-militarism activist. So, of course, that's something that we wanted to talk to her, but as always, we're going to make that local. Indeed. And without Dan or Rachel here to step on our toes... Uh, Mary and I got to sit down with Brittany in this virtual setting and hope that we can kick off the local enthusiasm for Congress, even though we are a little bit away from the election yet. So without further ado, our interview with Brittany Ramos de Barros. We hope you enjoy. We have here in the virtual studio with us today, such as it is, announced candidate for New York 11, Brittany Ramos de Barros. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and I'm a big fan. Well, now you've already introduced a new thing into the conversation. Have you heard an episode of Radio Free Bay Ridge before? (laughs) I would be remiss if I didn't listen to your episode on Nicole Maliotakis as a starting place. You do your homework. Well, I was thinking maybe we start off here. We have information, uh, Army logistics officer into organizer into candidate for New York 11 starting pretty early in the cycle here. We're about two years away from the election itself. So why now and why you? It's been a pretty wild ride to get here. Why now? The district is suffering. I don't have to tell people that. People all over the district are living that. Right now, we have the highest COVID rates in the city, and we don't even have a single public hospital here except for a small VA center, which is also underfunded and understaffed. We have incredibly high sickness rates in certain categories because of poor quality housing, public housing, because of uh, radioactive storage facilities that were located on this island. And those areas have still been clocked, ironically labeled Veterans Park. And for a while, the city put up a thing that said, don't dig here (laughs) as the solution. And I believe they've even taken down those notices. And for me, you know, thinking about my background, it's impossible to not connect the dots between the literal poisoning of our troops, both overseas because of burn pits, because of the radioactivity of war, um, that I should say that Afghans and Iraqis don't get to leave and escape, right? They're still dealing with that all the way to here in Staten Island, where we're seeing that same radioactivity make people sick make our elders have escalated levels of cancer rates, et cetera. You know, I could go on and on. Our schools being underfunded for so many reasons, but because of our broken education funding system that ties those schools to property taxes and all kinds of other issues. There's so many things that I could get into that are ways to articulate that people are suffering right now. And in the face of some of the most compounded crises that this district has faced in a long time, our representative voted against labor rights, voted against the PRO Act in the borough that has the highest union density in the city, voted against a constitutional (laughs) equal protection under the law, right? One of these things that we consider supposedly a fundamental American value, but in voting against the Equality Act made a statement essentially saying she doesn't believe that people should have equal protection under the law when they're being discriminated against on the basis of gender and sexuality, voted against COVID relief, and then went on the news and kind of tried to take credit for COVID relief getting passed and was like, oh, well, they're getting the checks. I mean, rightfully, the reporter was like, didn't you vote against that, though? And she was like, well, yes, because it was going to pass anyway. And I just don't, I just don't know what else could better encapsulate a complete like failure of leadership that is so rooted in catering to a jingoistic culture, political culture that ultimately is working against all of these values that we say that we believe in here in America. 
And I, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say while we're being told that we can't afford this COVID relief, we can't afford investment in infrastructure, we can't afford healthcare and education. We've spent $5.6 trillion on wars, one of them a war that I deployed to in Afghanistan that is having its 20 year anniversary this year. Last December, the Afghanistan papers came out with evidence of what so many of us have been saying for years, which was that there was no strategy, that there was no real positive purpose. (laughs) And I'll be honest with you, I sobbed for days when those Afghanistan papers were published and they didn't even hit the radars of probably most people. But as a person who deployed and really when I went, believed that I was going to help the Afghan people, I believed this lie. And yet when I was there, spent time with Afghan families and could see that we were doing so much more harm than the good, despite individually as troops, some of our best intentions, right? And I could also see that there were these corporate contractors there getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars while you have a private literally getting paid poverty wages. And I think that that was very politicizing for me in, in, you know, in kind of this arc that I've gone through. And that led me to get involved in speaking out about those wars, speaking on the topic of militarism, speaking on the way that it connects to these issues. To come back to the other question you asked, why me? Because people asked. I didn't plan to run for office. You'll see that in that, you know, I have all kinds of thirst trap photos on my Instagram. And, uh, you know, just I haven't lived my life in some kind of polished, sanitized way I'm not one of those people who has lived my life for years as if I was planning to run for office because I lived my life as a purses like a troop, real ass organizer who lives here and fell in love with this borough. But I also think that that's why people asked me to run is they said, we're tired of having these people who are put forward, who are kind of these like polished, manicured people who are not coming from a place of skin in the game. And I don't know all the policy details. I don't know all of the things that I wish I knew. But the reason that I am a going to be a good candidate and a good Congress person is because I am coming from a place of rootedness that this campaign is not about my career aspirations and it's not about me. It's about what this district needs It's about a calling that people in the district brought to me and said, we want you to run. And we believe that you could energize a base of people who has felt forgotten, knowing that I was also one of those people for a really long time who refused to register for a party because I felt like both of them were really letting me down. You know, even when I got involved and I know some of my organizer friends are like, gasp. (laughs) Um, But I think that a lot of people in Staten Island especially feel that way. You know, they feel like, why should I have a loyalty to these party structures when it feels like neither of them are really fighting for the most vulnerable of us? And of course, we shouldn't equivocate, right? There are real differences, especially now in the political landscape that we're dealing with, which is why I'm running as a Democrat and I'm proudly running as a Democrat. But ultimately, why me? There's nothing groundbreaking about me. I am talented. I'm friendly. I'm committed and determined and I'm a fighter. And I think that those are good qualities. But at the end of the day, I'm interested in a candidacy that is about bringing people in and I and like practicing co-governance and bringing folks in to help the folks who are most impacted by education policy or military policy, environmental policy, and who are in the trenches doing the work around those things. And that my role is to listen and to advocate for the agenda that we build together. So that was a very long answer to that question, but I'm a, I'm, I'm a complicated gal. <laughs> It's a very long question I asked. And you did the appropriate thing and I did the inappropriate thing, which was asking you two questions in one and you got to both anyway. There is the part in there that we can really dive in on. You started speaking about some very niche topics and that's kind of our bread and butter here. So I'm going to do the wrong thing again and ask you two questions. You mentioned the Afghan report. Yes, I don't think enough people heard about this because this is the first I'm hearing about it. So I wondered if you could maybe give our listeners a solid like 60 seconds on it. And then you mentioned this contrast between military contractors 
and members of the military. And I don't think that's a contrast that a lot of people know about either. And I wondered if you could maybe give us a little primer on that as well. Absolutely. Thank you for these questions. These are topics I love to talk about, not because they aren't deeply depressing, but because it hurts me, you know, how quiet these wars have become. And even as an anti-war movement coming out of that space, I've been critical of us, self-critical in our ability to really connect the dots back to a system of corporatism and legalized corruption. And I think that both of these things highlight And so on the first question, Afghanistan papers, they're called the Afghanistan papers because they were making a reference to the Pentagon papers that were released and were massively impactful in terms of shaping people's understanding and belief that the U.S. government and the U.S. military were lying about what was happening. And that helped to spark some historic anti-war movements and attempts to shift the way that the government was operating around war and military policy. The Afghanistan papers were released, I believe, December. If it wasn't December, it was January a year ago. And it was a collection of documents that had been declassified or collected and released. And they demonstrated a pattern of years of public elected and military officials knowingly lying to the American public, claiming that they had a clear strategy, claiming that there were levels of progress that were not happening, and covering up some of the true costs and abuses, both within the military and that the military was causing as a result of these bombing campaigns. A lot of people don't realize that, right? That when someone like me, when veterans or Afghan people or whoever it is, right, are speaking out and saying these wars are based on lies, it might be a controversial statement, but it is no longer an opinion. It is a well-documented fact for both Iraq and Afghanistan at this point. And beyond that, what those Afghanistan papers really validated but didn't get into is that for years... Our own government agencies have collected data about the progress of the global war on terror. And many people don't know that that is not just Iraq and Afghanistan. We are actively bombing over six countries as we speak at any given time. And those are just the ones that are acknowledged by the federal government. And that does not include counter terror operations in dozens and dozens of countries across the continent of Africa, what we talk about as the Middle East, South Asia, even Latin America, really all over the world. What a lot of people don't realize is that according to our own federal government statistics that have been collected on the effectiveness of the global war on terror, which presumably is to decrease the threat of terrorism in every place where we have invaded and occupied since 9-11, right? The numbers on the number of documented terrorist operatives and organized terrorist institutions have skyrocketed, not by like 10%. We're talking like 100% increases. In some cases, we saw a 1600% increase in documented terrorist activity in places where we invaded. With the combination of that data and the Afghanistan papers, our own metrics, this war has been a catastrophic failure when it comes to national security. It has made us less secure and less safe as a nation. At what cost? A lot of people know that we have a $700 billion military budget plus. What a lot of people don't know is that approximately 45%, almost 50% of that military budget goes to corporations not the troops. We're talking Raytheon, Boeing, right? Weapons manufacturers, other types of corporations who get defense contracts, which means that they're getting tax dollars. When we say $60 billion contract or $10 billion contract, that's tax dollars. I just want to make that extra clear. Their revenue is 75 to 90% made up of your tax dollars but is not subject to the same restrictions that a government agency would be subject to, right? And when we're talking about congressional approval for appointments and all kinds of things, protections that are there for accountability purposes, these wars allow them to have a market 
they turn around and they put that money back in the pockets of politicians. When I first spoke out publicly, 496 members of Congress were taking significant contributions from the defense industry. The next year, 507. That was after the blue wave. The number of members of Congress receiving defense dollars increased. Recently, it increased again. This is one of the most bipartisan things. People talk about working across the aisle and building unity. Well, we have a lot of political establishment unity that is on board with the defense industry continuing to make money. I was middle of the night angry researching because that's what I do when I can't sleep because I'm a nerd. And But I... I was researching what some of these lower level executives make, right? Because we all know CEOs get these like astronomically ridiculous compensation packages for these corporations. We're talking lower level executives. The lowest level of annual compensation package I could find was $4 million a year. You have 30,000 active duty military families on SNAP benefits, food stamps, and they have not done a good job of collecting the data. So this is a significant under report. The flip side is that the military is one of the only federal job programs that exists. I want people to think about that. Our most robust federal job program requires you to kill for the government, to be willing to. And I say that intentionally, not to offend anyone, but because we need to talk about what the purpose of a military actually is. Because we see, even in Staten Island, right, we were talking about the seawall and how do we protect for the next hurricane that we know is going to come and who was responsible for it, the Army Corps of Engineers. And that leads me to the question of why is the military constantly the only infrastructure that we have actually invested in and therefore our solution to every possible social ill that we face? With COVID, people were saying, mobilize the military and the National Guard. We should be asking the question of why do we not have an actually fully funded public health institution that is not a military? A military is designed to maximize violence. And we just need to be real about that. We use all of these euphemisms. We use all of these marketing terms. And I want youth who are considering this path to really be able to have truth in what they're signing up for. And I think that that's the just thing. It doesn't mean that everybody in the military is bad. It doesn't mean, you know, blah, 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 blah. But what it does mean is that politicians are going to talk about you. They're going to invite you to the State of the Union like they did me right before I deployed, they're going to shuffle you around as their like prized pony prop. And then when it comes to fund your health care, you're waiting and dying in the VA parking lot, not because the VA is fundamentally an example of a failure of the possibility of universal health care, the way that it's sometimes painted, but because it has been systematically defunded while we have expanded funding to these corporations and these executives who are making millions of dollars a year to do almost nothing, but oversee our investments in violence instead of in true safety and true health. I want to move in that space for a little bit. You mentioned the seed wall, right? And the Army Corps of Engineers and the ingrained nature there of the, we need that infrastructure. It goes through this program. Why is the Army the person that we we go to for it? In your thinking, because you mentioned systems thinking earlier, is that a fundamental disconnect for you that the seawall could perhaps not reach its best potential for Staten Island if done under the Army Corps of Engineers because of the issues of systematic defunding and money going to contractors? Is that no longer a safe place for that sort of infrastructure? I mean, at this point, our infrastructure is so underdeveloped that I'm happy for anyone to be building infrastructure, even if it's the Army Corps of Engineers. And this is not, I want to be very clear, a commentary on the quality of work that the Army Corps of Engineers, there are incredible, I deployed with an engineer battalion and saw a lot of that construction work firsthand. And they have done really amazing and impactful projects. But I think that the point is, is that we have a constitutional protection against the military operating on U.S. soil. And that was expanded upon by the Posse Comitatus Act. It expanded and clarified the constitutional protection concerns around the ways that monarchies had been mobilizing their militaries. And those protections are there for really important reasons. And so it's less a commentary on the safety of the Army Corps of Engineers doing the actual construction. And it's more a commentary on our obsession with having 
such an expanded military that we don't invest in anything else, that the best answer to every solution is brute force. And when we talk about militarism, right, there's a lot of ways that we see militarization play out. The 1033 program, transferred military equipment to local police forces all over the country, right? So a lot of people are familiar with that more material militarization. But when I say militarism, what I'm talking about is the fact that when we say foreign policy, people really mean military policy. The executive branch basically has not been held accountable in terms of their use of military force for decades. The, you know, the 2002, especially AUMF, authorization for use of military force, 2002 and 2003, I believe, to authorize the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. As Barbara Lee said at the time, the language was so broad that it was essentially a blank check. And that has been used to justify hundreds <laughs> of military interactions, operations, engagements around the world since then. You can see that even in the fact that you have operations happening far away from Iraq or Afghanistan, supposedly operating against, quote, terrorist organizations that didn't even exist when those authorizations for use of force were originally passed. You know, it's just been extrapolated and extrapolated and extrapolated. And I think that that, that is dangerous. It creates conditions that are rife for corruption. And all kinds of abuses of power, both within the military, as we're seeing with what happened at Fort Hood, reports on white nationalism within the ranks, which anyone in the military could have told you that this has been an openly acknowledged problem for years, and even reports like the Pentagon misplacing millions and billions of dollars and not being able to report to Congress where that money went, and there being no consequences. And so the point is, what is the society that we want to have? And I would argue that we want to invest in structures and infrastructure that are tailored to fundamentally meet the needs that uh, we have and solve the problems that we're trying to solve, rather than taking one institution that is designed to do violence and then constantly trying to retool it to solve a whole bunch of problems that it was never really meant to solve in the first place. I'm really interested in what you have to say about the military contractors versus the military personnel. And it seems to me that a lot of times when it does come to redistributing some of this money, there's always a loser. And we can say, oh, well, they're corporations, they're not the people, but people work for those corporations. So if Boeing loses a contract, they might close a factory and ruin families' lives. Two things come to mind. One is that I advocate for a framework called Just Transition. And my understanding of this framework is that it was developed by Indigenous communities who were in a microcosm of a similar predicament in that they could see that the coal mining companies were destroying the environment around them, were making their communities sick. but then. Also, those were the best and sometimes only jobs. And when faced with this question, this framework emerged that was around how do we acknowledge that there are real economic needs that individuals are facing right now that are created by the realities of the economy we have. Right now, we have a war economy. Our economy is heavily dependent on this production and talent pipeline for war and violence and occupation around the world. It's part of why we have 800 military bases around the world, while the entire rest of the world combined has approximately 70. And it's why also some Congress people who are maybe even openly anti-war will not vote to shut down military bases in their districts or factories, because those are the best job sources. We understand that if we're really rooted in caring for people, right, that's our ultimate goal. We can't only have a long view of that. We have to have a short view of that too. And what does it look like for us to systematically and slowly have a process of divesting from war as an economy and really investing in building up and investing in creating jobs in other industries that can shift the structure of our entire economy. And that's going to take time. But the starting place has to be an acknowledgement that we even have a war economy. And we have to start, I think, from a place of acknowledging that it is fundamentally immoral and it should be illegal to profit from war. I just can't understand what the justification 
for that could possibly be, right? I think that there are justifications for violence potentially in certain cases, which people might be surprised to hear me say, but I cannot wrap my mind around the justification for making a profit off of killing or off of violence. I think we have to start from that place and we have to make a commitment to each other that we want to build an economy that is based on real sustainable wellness. For every dollar that we invest in education, healthcare, and green jobs, in every single one of them, you get more jobs created than when you spend those dollars investing in military contracting and war. And there's a transition that is necessary there, but we can't afford to not make this transition. This war economy is literally, it is the largest cause for homelessness, forced migration, poverty, disease spread around the world, point blank. It is the largest cause for environmental destruction when you talk about the fact that even on this land in the United States, there are something like 80 million acres of land that need to be remediated because they were poisoned by some form of military toxicity and it's military land, including bases, right? Where the water is literally poisoning people sometimes. Could you talk about the just transition and how that might look in Staten Island and South Brooklyn? Sure. We have two military bases in the district, right? We have Fort Hamilton and we have Fort Wadsworth, which is a Coast Guard base, which a lot of people don't know that the Coast Guard is technically not part of the DOD, but still functions as a military, right? And there are other military units stationed there as well outside of the Coast Guard. And there alone, you can see that some of the affordable housing that exists in Bay Ridge is on Fort Hamilton because... They were trying to figure out how to squeeze in more affordable housing. And so they were like the military barracks. I just can't think of a more crystallized example of how about we don't put that on a military base, though. We just prioritize investment in affordable housing. Another example is what I briefly referenced earlier, which is a lot of people don't know that we had a weapon storage facility underneath where the Bayonne Bridge is now, the radiation from that is still poisoning people in Staten Island, right? And so when I say we cannot afford to not divest and move our investments to other industries that are actually building up housing and jobs and healthcare at the rate that we need, while also decreasing the amount of environmental destruction that's happening as a result of it, I think that those are two examples. But then when we think about transition, I was trying to look this up. And sometimes these statistics are kind of intentionally hard to figure out the number of people who have military or defense industry related jobs in our district. I don't think it's super high. When we're talking about divesting from this war economy at the macro level, those investments should be invested here. As uh, as somebody who's written about the just transition, I just want to thank you for bringing that up. It's something that gets a little bit under the radar when we talk about those sorts of things. I would also just point out the fun little fact, no borough would benefit more from adult education programming than Staten Island in terms of economic outcome. But I want to ask a really pessimistic question. And then I got an optimistic one for us to end on. Maybe I think Mary's got a pessimistic one if she wants to ask it later too. I want to end on the good note, but we're not there yet. So I want to walk your kind of argument through a couple of steps and then get to the kind of part of the conversation I don't hear too often. You kind of are talking about disinvestment and rethinking the military economy. You say that there's a lot of policy and there's a lot of reports and it's on your side. I think at a certain point, also, you've mentioned members of the military have talked about this. You probably have had a lot of members of the military maybe nodding along with you because they understand the system well. And at the end of this, we have you potentially in a congressional seat, which is famously had less control over the military because a lot of the power of the military goes to the executive branch, or a lot of it sits in the Pentagon, or a lot of it sits, as you've mentioned, in the kind of revolving door between DOD, Pentagon, and contract work. Have you done any kind of thinking or imagining how in a congressional seat, what you might do to do all of those things, despite those limitations? One of the reasons I said, yes, I will be a candidate and make my life public and open myself up to all the critics and fight for us is because I know that veterans are so tokenized as political props by both parties. And that has created the perception that we don't have our own stories and analysis and so much is done in our name. When Colin Kaepernick was facing all of that background, that was a politicizing moment for me. Before that, I didn't talk a lot about being a vet. 
And then I wrote a post supporting him, right? I'm a former debater. I was like, I'm going to make the arguments. There's going to be bullet points in the Facebook post. I took it, (laughs) took my Facebook post very seriously. And yet several people replied saying, you made some really good points I hadn't thought about before, but I still just can't support him because the veterans, that was the whole argument. And that was the moment it struck me like lightning. I was like, oh my gosh, I am a veteran. You are saying this to a veteran. And there are so many of us. These wars are unpopular in the military community, in the veteran community, the same way that they are with the general public. Troops will be the first ones to tell you, yeah, I saw contractors making hundreds of thousands of dollars while I was getting blown up on missions every day, making pennies and sending money home to my families, not even getting into the fact that we're spending a bomb that costs $100,000 every time we blow up, often innocent Afghan families. And that could fund an entire college education right there. So beyond the issues that are very specific to this district, I also want all of the other vets out there who feel alone, who feel like they're the only one who is hurt and feels exploited and betrayed by the fact that they signed up thinking that they were going to do good things. And then at worst feel like they did real harm that is hard to live with that we call moral injury. And at best feel like they didn't accomplish anything. There was no strategy. I want those folks to know that there are others like them. And I also am tired of seeing people of color, of seeing refugees, And other people who make it into Congress, even like Ilhan Omar, like the Cori Bushes of the world, right? Like all of these other people who have said this, and I'm tired of seeing them be invalidated in my name and be told that they don't love America or that they are not loyal. We are in these wars because there are people who are profiting from them, who put millions of dollars in the pockets of people to make sure that those tax dollars keep flowing to them instead of into our schools and into our healthcare system. To say that truth, there is nothing more patriotic. There is nothing more loyal to the people of this country and the values that this country is supposed to be about than to tell that truth, even if it means you're called a traitor. I know that maybe this feels like a dissatisfying answer to the question of how do I actually advance things given that this is where we're at. But I started out as a logistics officer and then I became a trained propagandist. I went to psychological operations school, which is literally about the propaganda that we spread around the world. And so I know how powerful these stories that we tell ourselves are as barriers to our willingness to collectively decide that we're going to choose solutions. We're going to choose to ask ourselves, is this really working for the goals, Republican, Democrat, independent, whatever you are? We all want safer communities. We all want an environment that can sustain us. Good jobs and good wages and unions that can protect us and all of these things. It takes us confronting the kind of narratives that are put out there about why we have these systems in order for us to be open enough to move beyond the jargon and the kind of team red, team blue bullshit that people get caught up in and say, is this working? For our mutual goal of safety and security. And if it is not working, then let's change it. Even if we don't know if that thing will work, let's start at least trying things other people have tried, whether it's here or abroad or whatever. And I really believe that that's the starting place because nationalism is a forgotten bigotry. We understand deeply, everyone, why it's offensive to say this person who was born with black skin deserves less rights, deserves less dignity and respect than this person who was born with white skin, right? And yet we haven't confronted this idea that because you're born on one side of an imaginary line, that you deserve less dignity, less respect, less access to care than someone who was born on the other side of the line. And that sense of bigotry that we as Americans deserve to treat people around the world however we want to treat them with no accountability, with no care for what the actual impact of that is, is something that we have not grappled with across the political spectrum. And I think that that is where we have to start. We have to start with this question 
of who belongs, who deserves dignity and respect and care. And we are having those conversations in different pockets, but we have not tackled the core logic of can you create safety with violence? And until we do that, these conversations will be stuck in red team, blue team, sound bites instead of a real solution oriented reckoning that is needed in order to engage with each other and with others around the world through the frame of cooperation and wellness instead of the frame of fear and violence. The conversation is dead. When it's alive, it's poison in the way that you're discussing. And having that position of moving a conversation for is not insignificant, especially if we are going to espouse democratic values, small d democratic values, as well as currently only big d democratic values as well, because the other party has decided not to come along with us on that one. I also think that that's something that is maybe a little different about this campaign and me as a candidate is that there's a lot of pressure to say, I can get this done right away and I can fix this problem. And there are some things that you just need people who are willing to vote yes, right? And like, you can get that done and it's ripe and it's ready. And I'm excited to be a part of moving those issues forward. But on something like this, where we're talking about the very fabric of our economy, the fundamental framework with which we choose to engage in relations with the rest of the world and with indigenous nations here, that's not going to be a quick fix. I would be wrong to claim that I can revolutionize that in a couple of years that I might be granted in Congress. But what I can do is I can use my experience from within that system on the ground, witnessing the harm of our current way of engaging with nations around us and way of trying to create security and use that to speak truth about our current reality and speak life into a vision of what's possible. A repeal of the AUMF has been brought up almost every cycle by Barbara Lee religiously and others. And yet it keeps not getting passed because people are scared of what is going to be said about jobs being lost in their district. They're scared about that they're going to be painted as not patriotic or not loyal to the troops. A fundamental starting place is saying there is nothing supportive to the troops about sending them to kill and die in wars that only benefit profiteers. That's where we have to start in order to unlock possibility and change the landscape of what's politically possible around these issues. How do you have that conversation when in your own district there's so much broken trust? During this last election cycle, I was hearing just awful things about total distrust of both parties because both parties bombed the Middle East and just no hope for the future in that regard. Like this is particularly, I think, painful thing to talk about in Bay Ridge. I'm not interested in telling people that their lack of trust isn't valid. It is valid. Full stop. That's demonstrated in the things that we've been talking about so far. I deployed under Obama Biden. I got my deployment orders in 2011, which is also when I graduated college and commission right out of college. Before I even graduated, I knew I was deploying. And I quickly became aware that the general public thought we had already left Afghanistan. My friends, my family, when I would tell them, they were like, wait, I thought we already left because the Obama administration made commitments and ultimately we didn't actually leave. We made the wars quieter. That was devastating for veterans too. I mean, several... I'm part of an organization which was originally founded as a rock vets against the war, and they lobbied hard in Obama's first primary. And I think we're a huge part of the movement that pushed Obama to position himself as the anti-war candidate in that primary. And when he announced the troop surge years later, we literally had several community members die by suicide. That's how devastating. So I can only imagine for immigrant communities and refugee communities whose families not only were also directly impacted by those wars, but in many cases didn't have the privilege of being able to leave and come home because it is their home. I can, I, I, I mean, I just can't, I can, I can only do my best to empathize with how devastating that is on, on such a deep 
and fundamental level. And I'm not interested in apologizing for that administration, frankly. We're here now, right? And I'm hopeful that Biden does better. But I was deployed when he famously in his vice presidential debate with Paul Ryan said, these other guys have conditions, not us. Unconditionally, no matter what, we are leaving Afghanistan in 2014. I was deployed when he said that, end of 2012. And I haven't forgiven him. I sobbed on inauguration day out of, yes, some level of relief, but also the fundamental heartbreak that that person who so betrayed me with that promise was now not only not accountable, but was elevated to a higher station. I guess if the question is like, what do we say to that? Or what do we do about that? There's power in truth. We can't heal and move forward until those truths are acknowledged. I really believe that. I I believe that as a fundamental principle. And so I think what we do is we don't try to say, oh, I was a war hero and I fought for your freedoms in Afghanistan, like some even Democrat politicians have tried to do. We don't put on this plastic patriotism charade. We tell the truth and we say that this was wrong and that it's done catastrophic harm and that that has been bipartisan. That is not something that is to be laid at the feet of either party. That is a fundamental American political truth right now. And we have the opportunity to do something different. I invite folks to join a movement where we decide that we're going to be rooted in truth and rooted in the transformation and healing that can come from unapologetically confronting these painful, loaded, politically inconvenient truths and saying we're going to fight for something different together. And we're not going to compromise no matter what the cost. I will never say I fought for people, for Americans' freedoms in Afghanistan because that's not what I did. Again, that's not an opinion at this point. People have said to me, the political, like, fancy campaign people who know all of the, like, fancy campaign things. (laughs) said, (laughs) I've said elections are are won at the margins and this is the 3% swing here and there. And so when I learned that frame of how these folks think, it was a frame for me to see, yes, the strategy in this district has been to court this mythical margin in the center. (laughs) But I don't think that there's really a center. I think that there are polar ends of political belief. And then I think that there are working class people who know that the political system we have is failing them, that most of these people don't give a shit about them or their neighborhood and that their life isn't actually going to change on a day-to-day basis, regardless of whether the, you know, it's a D or an R behind the person's name. And I think that they have checked out because of that reality. And so I'm interested in them because I've been that person. I have skin in the game. It's not about party loyalty Loyalty to America is not loyalty to the government and certainly not to like the political establishment that runs our government. It is loyalty to the working class people who have been left behind by both of those parties and elite corporate people whose loyalties are to corporations and wealthy people, right? And not us. And so I think that there's a lot of appetite for that in this district, even amongst folks who, you know, I was just canvassing on the South Shore. You know, I was petitioning, so we had to find registered Democrats in order for them to be eligible to sign the petition. I think people would have been floored by the number of people who said, no, I'm an independent. Can I sign? That speaks to the level of appetite that people actually have, even in parts of the district that are seen as the most conservative parts. That populism, right? That acknowledgement that these corporations and these elites are not actually here for us, regardless of what they say. People will see that in me throughout this campaign. I think that they'll see that I'm a real person, that there's a lot I don't know. I'm learning a lot. I make mistakes. I have made plenty already. You know, I mean, there's just going to be all kinds, people are going to say all kinds of things about me, right? What I hope the takeaway is, is that, yes, that's because I'm a normal person who until I, you know, people came to me and said, why don't you run for Congress? I was just living my life, going to grinding and trying to make ends meet and doing all of these things, trying to keep my sister in her housing and just doing, you know, the things that I think a lot of us are trying to do. One of the ways that programs that weren't called just transitions in the past have failed, Georgia Works being one of them, for example, is that these programs are promising future employment for people who are about to lose their jobs because the factory is closing down or this, that, or the other. The reason typically when they fall off is that those jobs don't exist in time for the people who are being fired and they get fired and then they just disappear. 
So I want to bring in another Army veteran uh, who ran for president in the last cycle. He was Seth Moulton, and he, he didn't last long in that very large Democratic primary. But one thing that he did propose that was adopted a little bit by Biden and by some others was essentially a civilian federal program that was exclusively focused on infrastructure and climate infrastructure. So I was wondering, you want to move the kind of work that you're talking about outside of the military. Starting from the ground up, how would you build a new system of public interaction and work that does not repeat the issues that you talked about in the Army and in the military? That's a great question. I would support a program like that. I think we should have a jobs guarantee. And I think that there is so much work to be done that is not invested in our bridges, our highways, our roads that also our economy depend on are crumbling all around the country. And that's not even getting into the other types of infrastructure like schools and books. And you have teachers out here bootstrapping, paying for their own, you know, it's just hell yes to other federal jobs programs that actually build up our communities. My general philosophy about government is that it should be minimal authority and maximum benefits. That will get me in trouble a lot on the campaign trail at some point because of certain questions around criminalization and how do you handle certain issues. And I will say minimal authority does not mean not regulation, right? I think we should heavily regulate institutions that wield disproportionately high power, right? Like large employers, Wall Street, you know, people who are profiting from the financialization also of our economy. Hopefully this isn't frustrating for folks, but since we're in this law for I, I want to get to the core political principle because I also think that partisanship is kind of a disease in our country and that it has created this culture where we hold policy positions that are not always rooted in kind of a core set of political principles. And so a couple of the political principles that are underneath what I've already been talking about is moving away from privatization. So when we think about even education in terms of the charter school debate and all of these things, what we're seeing is more and more public dollars, instead of being invested in job programs that would expand good jobs that are secure, right, and could be rolled out on a timeline that is necessary for this kind of transition, we're seeing more and more education dollars, healthcare dollars, right? When we talk about the privatization of the VA, in every category, there's this trend of the small amount, honestly, of public dollars that are allocated for actual public benefits being then handed off to privateers. And that doesn't translate to the same amount of jobs and it doesn't translate to the same quality of jobs. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity when we apply that political principle across those categories to see where we can add jobs on short timelines. Another principle is this concept that like people talk about the free market, right? And I do think that there's a deeper debate to be had about like, how do you cultivate economic freedom? Because that is a concern that I think that people who consider themselves more conservative have. Being a person who grew up in a kind of libertarian conservative family, there are real valid, principled concerns that are underneath some of this jargon that gets popularized that we should grapple with. There are real dangers if the government has too much control, right? Because if the government is offering all of these jobs and all of these benefits, what happens, right, if things go sideways and our democracy is weak at best and it is being further eroded, right, with the laws that we just saw passed in Georgia to expand voter suppression, et cetera, right? There's all of these structural things that undermine the democratic execution of some of these benefits. And I think that the reason that people get really stuck and concerned about the idea of a free market is that there's this question, which is how can someone actually make free choices if their survival depends on those choices. So there's no actual at-will employment if you can't feed yourself and house yourself if you lose that job. You're not actually making a free choice. You're making a coerced choice. Same thing, right? With healthcare, with all of these things, you're not actually able to engage with the market from a free place if your survival is at stake. So then I think that leads us to the question of how do we cultivate systems in our society that allow people to be secure in their survival and allow for them to have confidence that their basic needs will be met, that then create the conditions for them to engage from a truly free place. And I'm excited. I'm excited. You know, I don't feel like I have all of the answers about how you do that, but I'm excited to be on this journey and organizing and pulling more and more people into this process whose lived experience 
and expertise that doesn't always fit the kind of norms of who is considered an expert to bring out new ideas, innovations that we haven't even had the opportunity to explore yet. I think that that's what this whole campaign and race is about, is about possibility. That's so often painted as impractical, but I would say that the reality that we have right now is quite impractical. I think I want to thank Benny Ramos de Barros for giving us so much of your time on a Saturday evening. I tell you, our Saturdays look different here in COVID times, but <laughs> not a bad way to spend it, I think. Thank you for letting me come and share and asking such amazing questions to, you know, give me the opportunity to speak on these things in ways that are go beyond a sound bite. <laughs> Well, that's what we do here. We're happy that you declared and we got to get you on this early. Well, we have a lot of organizing to do. That's why we had to start early. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on and speaking with us. It's been such a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Thank you again. So folks, that's our show for today. Uh, if this was your first intro to Brittany ramos Deveros, let us know on Twitter or Facebook. We are at Radio Free BR. Or check out the show notes at RadioFreeBayRidge.org. And until next time. Stay free, Bay Ridge.